Ladies and gentlemen, Aaron Cheatham. All right. So just a couple of ground rules real quick. I don't know if anyone noticed, but there are a lot of people here right now that dictate whether or not I have a job after this presentation. <laughs> so no matter what happens, I need you to nod like you're listening intently. If I say something that looks like it's mildly trying to be funny, just laugh. Don't. Just do me a favor and laugh. So, but in all honesty, it's, it's an honor to be here. Fun fact, apparently I am the 5,236th program to present at this Rotary Club. So, I, I think that's pretty amazing. I've never been the 5,236th of anything, so. Um, I really appreciate that that title, um, and then of course to be among all of you guys, this Rotary Club who's been committed to making a difference in the community for over a hundred years. I think that's awesome, and you guys also de de deserve a round of applause for that. <laughs> so reentry and transition manager. It probably sounds like someone just made that up. That's because I just made that up, and and now it's my title. So, and hopefully throughout the presentation I can explain what it is that the reentry and transition manager does. Um, so I can't start by t talking about the, the impact that we're making in the community without first, as Clint kind of touched on, our relationship with the Department of Corrections. Um, so since 1995, we've given inmates the opportunity to come to the farm, gain experience, gain certifications, uh, be able to put things on their resume that they wouldn't have been able to put in the past so that way when they get released that they're able to put these skills to work and actually be prepared for reentry back into society and be productive members of society. Um, over the course of 23 years this has grown to roughly 200 inmates that are coming out on any given day and they're working, they're building skills, they're gaining experience and not just in you know aspects of the farm that are specific to Hickman's, but there's a lot of skills that, are, that have a wide range of applicability to other businesses so that they can go on into the community and do, you know, whatever it takes for them to be productive members of society. And of course, it goes without saying, this helps reduce recidivism. This helps make it so that when these people come back into the community, they're not committing more crimes or doing whatever they have to do to survive. They have skills that they can use to actually go to work. Why is this important? Why do we care about this thing? Why do we want to reduce recidivism? Why has Director Ryan committed to reducing the number of people that are in prisons and, and getting people back into the community? So I thought I'd use some numbers just to kind of reflect why this is important. So 42,000, that is actually the number of incarcerated people in the state of Arizona. That's a huge number. In fact, that's almost more than U of A has as their entire student body. Um, almost, not quite. Almost, I'm just saying. Well, I guess, what am I saying? That's, that's an entire university of, you know, population that's locked away in our prisons. Just to give us an idea of that number. Um, 357,000. That is the number of Arizonans with the current felony. And of course that number is growing. There's a statistic that says that someone who has a felony is probably 50% less likely to get employed than someone who doesn't. And if that number is growing, that means that those are Arizonans that are having a much more harder time finding employment and they're sort of being labeled as a misfit to society. Um, so of course that's a problem. 25,000, that is the amount it costs to incarcerate one person in the state of Arizona. That's over the course of a year. And if we think about the 42,000 that are incarcerated, that's over a billion dollars that we're putting into housing inmates. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that's a large number. 95, this is probably my favorite statistic because there's a misconception here. Um, that is the percent of inmates that will be released back into the community. A lot of times, you know, we send people away after they've committed a felony and we, and we feel like we can just forget about them. But there's a misconception because 95% of those people are coming back into our community. And guess where they're moving to? They're moving back. You know, they're going to be our neighbors. They're going to be playing at the park with their kids while we're playing at the park with our kids or our grandkids. Um, and they are members of our community. 
they're just kind of away in prison and they're, you know, they're serving their time, but they are coming back. And we can't forget about that. So what are we doing to help them transition in the community? What are we doing to make, make it so that they can be productive and not have to go back into a life of crime? And that's a question that we have to ask ourselves. Um, before I get into that, I, I use this segment to kind of talk a little bit more about myself because I think it's important as far as why I'm uniquely qualified for this position. So I was born and raised in Arizona, lived here pretty much for my whole life. Um, graduated from Brophy College Prep, uh, moved to Dallas for four years, graduated from Southern Methodist University with a bachelor's degree in chemistry. Um, and then I came back to Arizona and things kind of spiraled out of control for me. Long story short, I don't want to get into the nitty gritty of everything, but I ended up in prison. I was in prison for two years. And then after that, I had to serve two years on parole. And yeah, and it, it wasn't pretty at all. And the reason I bring this up is just so that I can see how the faces change. Even Mr. President, just now I caught him. Um, the way you look at me immediately changes when I say that, you know. Before I was just this well-spoken, good-looking gentleman up here speaking. <laughs> but now, as soon as I divulge that information, now I have this scarlet letter on my chest and I'm a felon. Some of you guys maybe even forgot about everything else I just said in this presentation and you're thinking to yourself, wow, you went to prison? Um, and the reason I bring that up is because that's what every felon deals with when they come out of incarceration. You know, we, they see that box, we check that box, and automatically, we don't want them in our community, we don't want them working for us, we don't want them around our kids, and they're labeled as a misfit, and we don't want them. So, even someone like me, who comes up here and, you know, well-spoken, mildly good-looking, and... <laughs> but still, you, you kind of write me out. There's a part of you that says, you know what, wow, that guy right there, he's a felon, and... You know, it's, it's, it's one of those natural prejudices. We all do it automatically. We don't, even, we don't even know we're doing it, but we do it. So I just thought I'd, I'd bring that up. Now, little confession. I wasn't 100% honest about that. When I was in the Department of Corrections, I was actually working as a corrections officer. Um, and I worked as a parole officer as well for two years. So even Mr. Hickman Sr. was like, oh my goodness, who do we hire? <laughs> Nobody told me this. <laughs> Rest assured, you're okay. We're good. I do not have a felony background. But the message there is still the same, though. We do that automatically. So now everybody's smiling again. Okay, we're good. <laughs> now, as my time, when I, was, when I was working as a parole officer, you know, as a parole officer, you're the first person someone comes and sees when they get released from prison. And I saw with an alarming rate that a lot of guys are coming out and they're homeless and they're, they don't have the potential for employment or it's just gonna be really, really difficult to get that employment. And of course, if, if you don't have those two essential things, a stable residence and stable employment, poverty is just the next thing. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm going to do whatever I have to do to survive and I'm going to find a way to eat something. And if all I know from the past is criminal activity, that is what I'm gonna fall back on. So that's why that's a problem. Um, and then of course, so this cycle continues. These people are just going to go right back because they don't have a way to support themselves or um, we have the community who has that automatic prejudice against this population. So kind of the, the, the odds are stacked against them. Um, I also saw that, you know, there were those indiv individuals that came out and they had stable residents. They had stable, you know, maybe they had potential employment down the road or they had an interview coming up and you could just see it in their, their lives. They were much more likely to be sober, they were much more likely to, to lead a healthy family life, and ultimately, they just had more success. So, of course, the question comes up again, you know, what are we doing to help these people transition back into our communities? Because they're coming whether we like it or not. Um, another statistics, one in 13 Arizonans have, has a felony. So looking at the population in here, there's probably about four or five felons in this room right now. <laughs> Don't raise your hand, we don't need to know who you are, but that's what the statistics show. So, um, 
Little did I know this vision was already in work, and, and this is something, like I said, for tw over 23 years, the Hickmans have been working in this area, and this whole project just evolved from, from that relationship. So, and of course, we, we come to our employee housing, and this is really something that we're really proud of and we're really excited about because um, even just the idea, it's quite simple. You know, you give someone a stable residence, you give them the access to employment, and you don't make them have to travel to get there. You know, there's not a need for housing, there's not a need for employment, and there's no need for transportation. Those are three barriers that almost all recently released offenders have trouble with. So, thus the Hickman housing. So, go ahead and give us a round of applause right there. Just one time, one time, one time. Someone wanted to do it, so I just thought I'd do it. Okay, so 40 units, and these units are fully furnished. They have everything that you could possibly need to start off stable. So you have your, your mattress, you have comforters, you have the linens, you have a 42-inch television, you have, oh wait, I can actually show in the, these in the pictures. So each one is single occupant. That is actually one of the ex-ACI workers that worked as an inmate and just two weeks after being released he was working as an electrician on the farm. So just two weeks after being released he is now a tax-paying citizen and living and working as a productive member of society. Um, comes with a full-size bed, uh, full bath with all the work, so all the, all the shower curtains, the towels, everything that you see in the images actually come in one of these units. So when they walk into the unit for the first time, it's like, wow, all of this is mine. There's a sense of ownership and a sense of pride there. And also a sense that the community that they've just now gotten back into is actually investing in them. This is the full kitchen. Uh, comes with oven, microwave, refrigerator, all the dishes that they need to, you know, cook meals and prepare their own meals, which is also a part of the programming aspect. Not only are you going to come out and maintain your housing and go to work, but you're going to come home, you're going to cook your own meals, you're going to go grocery shopping, um, and you're going to do the things that, you know, all of us sort of take for granted, the things that were, you know, they were told they had to do before, you know, time to go to chow, time to lock down, time to go to sleep, light, lights out. Now they're sort, of, they're sort of put in a situation where they're able to manipulate all those things themselves. It's huge. So there's also laundry room, all-purpose meeting room, proximity to work, parking, like-minded community. Um, I put a question mark next to the unlimited eggs because I'm still sort of working on that. <laughs> Glenn's looking at me sideways like, uh, we didn't agree to that. <laughs> yeah, question mark. Uh, another component that's really powerful with this program. So when they come out, it would be unjust to let them know that, you know, you kind of get all this and you don't have to you don't have to pay for it. Or any, it would be an injustice to them to let them know that they didn't have to pay bills. So when they come in, they're actually paying 20% of what they make a week into the program fee. So, and this is something that they actually see on their pay stub. So when they get their paychecks, it says program fee. So for most of this, that would be like rent. And they see exactly where their money's going. They're able to budget their money and they can actually map out like, hey, how much money am I gonna have left to go grocery shopping, for clothes, for savings? And speaking of savings, so that 20% that we take, or, or that it goes into their program fee, um, in order to encourage continued employment, uh, positive behavior, productive reintegration, reintegration, they have the potential to get 50% of that back once they leave. So all the money that goes in, 50% of that actually goes back to them as they transition out, as a way of sort of like a stipend to sort of transition funds. Hey, put this money down on your brand new house, on your apartment, um, maybe you decide to get a vehicle now. Um, and then of course, this is just another form of that investment that we as the community are putting back into their lives and gives them a sense of ownership in their own lives. Like, hey, I'm actually controlling this and I'm actually making this happen for myself. 
it goes without saying, you know, the program also offers, you know, they're getting the work training, that, that goes without saying, that they can use not only at Hickman's but anywhere else. Uh, financial planning, time management, soft skills, the work ethic, all this stuff they're kind of getting in this one environment. Um, and of course, this is what we look at when we think of a productive member of society. And then when the time comes when, you know, let's say a year down the line, they're ready to move on, which we've actually just had a, a really great success story of a female who came out, and I don't know if any of you guys saw the ABC 15 News article with Amanda Smith, but she was there for almost four months, and she saved her money. She used that time to reconnect with her family, and she would always pull me aside, and she said, Aaron, this is amazing. You know, I went and visited my son, and this is the first time he's seen me sober. And having that, and having this, you know, she since transitioned from our program, and she purchased her own house in Tonopah, and she's still working at the farm. So, and that's really what it's about. A lot of people ask, what is the monetary gain? When really, that's something that's really hard to track, but you know, one of, one of the, the, the immediate gains that you see automatically are the emotions that you get with people and the immediate life changes that start to happen right after that. So, and that's something that's priceless. If you think about this population and you know, you come, you're getting out and you don't really know what your opportunities are gonna be and you get someone that cares and actually invests in your future. You know, these are people that are gonna come into the community and they're going to be very appreciative. They're gonna work a little bit harder because they don't really have too many more options. And to be able to invest in this and be a part of this, it's definitely an honor to me. And I appreciate you guys letting me share that story with you guys today. If you guys have any questions, I'll be in the back table in the, at the end. Thank you, Aaron. My question is, I'm a flooring contractor and we hire ex-cons and, and people who are on parole. The problem we run into, and maybe this is for Mr. Montgomery, is if I'm doing like a GSA contract or something, uh -huh. they're, they're not going to allow us to go in there as a felon or as a person out of prison. We run into a lot, and even some of the contractors we work for, how do we, how, what do we do to change their minds so they become more like you guys and we can allow us to work in, in these locations? Because we're always looking for help in the trades here in Arizona educating the community, doing presentations like this, and I remember, it was a few months ago, the Department of Corrections had a reentry forum um, that I was on the panel of, and, and really what they did was they got together business owners and, and people who were running their businesses in the community. I, I believe there's maybe about 300 businesses there, and they just informed the public about what's going on and, and how this population can actually be productive. Is it gonna happen overnight? Probably not. But the more stories that we have like this, um, I think it's something that's going to spread like wildfire. So hopefully, you know, we start with education. There are many women that are in the home. Um, it's about 50-50, male and female. That, yep. That's yep. my question. What's the ratio? And then is there a, a time limit? Do you have six-month program, two-year? Yeah. What is that? The transition is going to be different for everyone. There is really no set time. It's sort of an indefinite time period. But we offer the most incentive for people that are that adamantly want to transition within a year period. So we we offer that incentive program where we give back 50% of the program fee that they put in. That happens at a year. That's our way of saying, hey, we want to help you transition out of here at a year. At 15, 18 months that percentage goes back down. So we kind of offer that incentive to kind of get out. Amanda Smith, as you can see, it only took her three to four months and she was ready to go. So transition's gonna be a little different for everyone. And you know, when you're dealing with humans, you, you just gotta kind of work with them and, and figure out what they, what they wanna do. Stay with me for just a second. So Aaron, thank you so much for your presentation today. I think it was very enlightening to all of us here today um, what's being done and what the Hickmans are doing. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, so in um, recognition of your uh, participation today, we have a certificate for you. And we've made a donation in your name to the uh, Salvation Army's Adult Rehabilitation Center, which is a six-month inpatient drug and alcohol treatment program. Uh, totally free to the participant and um, 
one of the four charities that we're supporting this year to reduce homelessness here in the Phoenix area. So thank you again, and thank you again to the Hickmans for everything you do. It's amazing. Thank you. Thank you.